Before joining the faculty at the University of Utah, Dr. Mangrum earned a um, BA in English from UC Berkeley, then an MA and PhD in English from the University of Michigan, and then she went on to complete a postdoctoral fellowship at Cornell. Dr. Mangrum is an American literature scholar whose research centers on what happens to U.S. narratives of slavery when written texts and visual texts converge. Her current book project is titled How Deep and Dark, Slavery, Photography, and the Limits of Narrative. In this project, Dr. Mangrum demonstrates how photography as a revolutionary technology of the 19th century transformed the genre of U.S. slave narratives. Today we have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Mangrum um, to Westmont to offer us some particular insights on the U.S. abolition movement and its use of narrative and image in interaction. Her lecture today is titled, How a Man Becomes a Thing, or The Danger of the Icon in U.S. Abolition. She's going to use this time to argue that abolitionists' sense of political and moral urgency in the 18th and 19th century led to a number of early experiments in virtual reality. By translating numbers into pictures and pictures into immersive and interactive narratives, abolitionists offered readers and viewers the illusion of being eyewitnesses to slavery's horrors. Um, we're going to make sure to leave 10 minutes at the end for Q&A, so be formulating some good questions for Dr. Mangrum, and let's extend her a warm welcome to Westmont. Uh, thank you, Dr. Skripsky. Uh, thank you to the other professors in the English department for inviting me to come and speak with you. And thank you all for being here and listening. Um, I'll just begin. Um, how a man becomes a thing or the danger of the icon in U.S. slavery. Uh, case study. All right. May I press the button? Okay. Um, Um, in Toni Morrison's novel, Beloved, after Denver sees a ghostly figure embracing her mother's waist, her mother, Setha, explains that what she saw was someone else's rememory, a remembrance of the past so clear that it takes on heft and becomes corporeal, an embodied presence that one might bump into and touch, a physical space that one might stumble upon and enter into, for Setha, encountering a person's rememory is a dangerous enterprise, one that she advises her daughter Denver to avoid at all costs. In Setha's concept of rememory, other people's lived experiences become pictures. Um, these pictures or rememories um, are acted out over and over again in the environment. Um, and are awaiting an imagined audience. But when that audience actually encounters that rememory, right, um, it leads to devastation. Right? So in today's talk, um, I argue that this, this kind of a 21st century understanding of slavery was actually anticipated uh, by abolitionists in the 18th century. Um, and I argue that a, a sense of moral and political urgency led 18th century abolitionists to anticipate Morrison's conception of rememory, re um, and that these abolitionists, understanding the impossibility of representing slavery to those who had never experienced it, um, also recognized that representing slavery was necessary, and necess um, recognizing that it was necessary had to do it anyhow. So to give you a sense of how uh, abolitionists talked about representing slavery. Um, William Wells Brown, he was a former, formerly enslaved man who escaped from slavery and became a, an abolitionist um, and a lecturer and uh, one of the great first African-American writers. Uh, he wrote the first novel, uh, African-American novel. Um, he wrote, slavery has never been represented. Slavery can never be represented. But <laughs> if I were to represent it to you, I should wish to take you one at a time and whisper it to you, right? Um, folks like Harriet Jacobs, Frederick Douglass, um, many formerly enslaved African Americans speak at the beginning of their texts, their narratives in which they describe their lives in slavery at the beginning as a preface, um, as a caveat. They say, 
it's impossible to represent to you how terrible this is. But then they try it anyhow. Um, so, so what I'm going to talk about today is um, the kind of innovative narrative experiments that 18th century abolitionists um, engaged in, in the effort to tell this impossible story. Um, and I'm going to do that, right, talk about how they were telling stories by talking about this, this idea of the icon. Um, so as a way to kind of uh, define icon before I go into it, um, and also uh, to give you a, a kind of blueprint of the rest of the talk, right, um, so I'm going to kind of go over um, the three most essential anti-slavery icons um, and focus deeply on the last one, the slave ship Brooks, um, before ending by talking more deeply about the dangers of this kind of iconic imagery, although important, right, um, 70 years later in the 1850s and the 1860s. Okay, so first, uh, what is an icon, right? Um, so uh, the, the icon is that which both represents um, and venerates. When we think of beauty, for example, we think of maybe Marilyn Monroe. Um, if we think of like godliness and forgiveness, right, we might consider Desmond Tutu. Um, Nicole Fleetwood, a, a visual culture scholar, um, defines the early icon as rooted in a desire to represent and thus produce God. Um, so if we think of religious iconography in some Christian faiths. Um, when used in popular culture, the iconic or the icon often represents the apex of an idea, um, the apex of beauty, Marilyn Monroe or the best of a group, right? Um, but Nicole Fleetwood all, also reminds us that the black icon has become something different in our culture. Um, and I'm, I'm going to read briefly from her text here. Uh, Nicole Fleetwood writes, while the icon carries the trace of God-likeness to render a subject as black within various histories and discursive traditions means literally and symbolically to denigrate. To blacken, disparage, belittle. The verb to denigrate with its Latin origins and roots in light, dark metaphors means not only to blacken, but also to defame and to discredit. To denigrate is a castigation in which darkness is associated with incivility, evil, mystery, and the subhuman. Uh, racial iconicity hinges on a relationship between veneration and denigration, and this twinning shapes the visual production and reception of black American icons. Um, so when Nicole Fleetwood talks about this kind of paradoxical nature of the icon, when it um, encounters blackness, right, um, this kind of twinning of veneration and dishonor, I'm going to try to trace um, this 21st century and 20th century and 19th century phenomenon back to the 18th century. Um, and so here I go. All right, um, so um, how did pictures uh, drive the anti-slavery movement? Um, there are three iconic move, uh, three iconic images: the kneeling slave icon, the runaway slave icon, and the slave ship Brooks, um, all of which were essential anti-slavery uh, icons. Now I'm going to go very quickly through the first few and then spend more time on on the Brooks icon. Um, so this this image here, am I not a man and a brother? Um, it was created by a group in uh, in Britain called the Society for the uh, society to affect the abolition of the slave trade, ceased, right? Um, and ceased created this image um, as a seal, um, but also um, translated the picture into uh, cameos, right, that women could put on their clothes. Um, one famous abolitionist uh, put this image, um, so the story goes, on her wedding purse, right? So um, this image becomes a way to um, identify the, the abolitionist movement, right, and abolitionist thinking. Um, very early on, the image is circulated widely, right? Um, if you were a person in uh, Boston in 1788, you'd have as easy access to a person in, as, in, um, as easy access as would a person in London. Um, because it was shipped to Benjamin Franklin. Uh, Franklin distributed these images in the States. When we think about this image, uh, we think about abolition, right? So this, this image became the icon of abolitionist thinking. Um, the, the next image is the image of the runaway slave, um, and it was born in uh, just the practical needs to bring attention uh, to a, an ad 
um, in newspaper print that was very small and very narrow, right? Um, when you have 18th and 19th century newspapers, if you want people to pay attention, you, you would use this, it, it was uh, literally called a stereotype, um, an image, um, and the image would bring people's attention to your ad. Um, this was often used to uh, advertise for runaways. Um, by people who were slaveholders. Um, the abolition movement picked up on the imagery, however, and used it as a way to uh, signify black people's um, distaste for enslavement, right? Um, and the runaway, which was used as a practical means of slaveholders getting their enslaved people back into slavery, um, became a symbol of black people's desire uh, for and, and very clever uh, 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 plays for freedom. Does that make sense? Right. So those are the first two. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about how they become dangerous. Um, um, so although this image was made to be um, one that honors and aids the enslaved person, it often supplanted the individual for the image. Um, one example is in 1837, um, a formerly enslaved man named Charles Ball, um, instead of having his image on the front of his book, this is the image um, that was included on the front of his book, right? Um, so in, what we have is this sense that um, he is erased from history, at least visually, right? We have no image of Charles Ball for that reason. Um, most formerly enslaved people, if we know what they look like, we know it because they wrote um, narratives about their lives, and those narratives often included images. Um, but this is what we have for Charles Ball's image. Um, we have his words, but not his face. Um, one man who uh, is now named um, by John Stuffer, a historian, as the most photographed man of the 19th century, uh, Frederick Douglass. Uh, Frederick Douglass was, was very intentional about having his photograph taken um, and taking control of his image, making sure um, that it was reproduced um, in ways that was satisfying, satisfying to him. Um, but what we find is that the ways in which he's seen by others, right, um, he's seen within the iconography of, of the anti-slavery movement. So he's been reintroduced here as a, a runaway slave. This image is not meant to denigrate. It is meant to honor. Um, it was actually made by a white abolitionist who was a great fan of Frederick Douglass um, and wanted to pay tribute to him. Um, but what we find is that folks are getting boxed in by that early iconography of the 18th century, um, even in 1845. Um, I just wanted to give you a couple of extra images of Douglas. Um, he was a good looking man and I think he knew it. <laughs> so he, he, I was just like, yay, that's fun. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Is, is this making sense? Okay. So what we have is, um, in the 18th century, we have the tension between the impossibility of representing slavery and the necessity of doing so. Um, and, and what people did was they did a series of uh, intermedial experiments. So uh, a man named Thomas Wedgwood, uh, he was a student. Um, and I will just read this section. All right. Um, so the blueprint for the slave ship Brooks, that's what this is, uh, was initially created and circulated by Thomas Clarkson in 1787 and quickly became one of the most well-recognized images of slavery and the slave trade. Uh, Thomas Clarkson's career as an abolitionist began with the prize-winning essay that he wrote for um, an essay writing competition while a student at Cambridge. Uh, within two years of his first study, Clarkson traveled 35,000 miles across Britain, visiting slave ports in London, Liverpool, Plymouth, and Bristol, where he gathered documents and interviewed thousands of individuals involved in the transatlantic slave trade, um, all as evidence of the slave trade's cruelty for an unaware public. Um, so what Clarkson did was, he did a lot of work in those two years. Um, what he would do is he would go from slave port to slave port, um, and try to find people who were interested in speaking with him. Um, he first tried to speak, of course, to uh, the merchants who made the slave trade possible by paying for the ships and loading the ships, um, the merchants who would have the most to win or lose, right, um, if slavery were abolished. And they wouldn't talk with him. Actually, they tried to kill him. Um, <laughs> they, um, he was literally attacked by 
by um, two men and uh, they tried to throw him into the sea, but he, it didn't work, so that's good. Um, and so what Clarkson does is he finds that he's got to talk to the people who are on the lowest end of the totem pole, um, and those are the sailors on these slave ships. So he interviews uh, thousands and thousands of, of sailors, um, and he takes all of these narratives um, and accumulates them, and what he's got now is just all these different stories, right? This is his data, the stories of the sailors. Um, he's finding patterns in the stories, um, and he's writing about them, but what he's finding is that the writing is, is you know, being read by some people, but not others. It is 18th century England. Not everyone can read, um, and maybe not everyone wants to um, read these texts. Um, so he starts to use images like this one. Um, to convince people that they should care about slavery. Um, during his research, he, he figured out, he figured out not only how the sailors were treated, but how the enslaved people below the deck of the ship were treated. Um, and what, what do you imagine were some of the conditions on board a slave ship um, if you were one of the enslaved people below the deck of the ship? You can just shout out guesses. What was it like? Unsanitary, right? So there's not going to be a lot of uh, way to keep yourself clean. Um, so all the, the things that human beings do um, is going to be in the space with you. I know you're trying to eat. <laughs> um, anyone else? Good. What else? Yes. Cramped. Yeah, cramped. Yeah. Yes. Cold. Cold? No fresh air. No fresh air. Good. Excellent. Um, all of this and more, right? So when we talk about like the physical sensations you would have as a person below the hold of the deck, um, you're, you're going to have high mortality rates. All of this uh, kind of like lack of sanitation leads to spread of disease. Um, you're going to have not enough food, water, or air. Um, and, and you're also going to have the, the misuse and abuse um, of enslaved people. Uh, women were raped. Uh, men were beaten, um, and revolt and resistance because of this was common. Uh, you, you have to get this. Like, enslaved people revolted aboard ships all the time, so much so that the architecture of the ship was built to discourage revolt. All right. Um, okay, let me, let me slow down. So, okay, we'll get back to Clarkson for a little bit before going on to the story of the enslaved people. Um, so Clarkson had all of these stories of different sailors. Um, he, he also runs into a blueprint of a loaded slave ship. Uh, he runs into the blueprint of, oh, I'm getting ahead, of the Brooks. Um, he uses this blueprint um, to show the ways in which Enslaved people are, are put closely together on the ship. Uh, the lack of physical distance between each of the small dark figures that you see here uh, work to give the viewer a sense of slavery's inhumanity. Um, and yet the thing about this, this blueprint, right, is it's a representation of um, a ship after regulation. Uh, this depicts 454 people. Um, the slave ship Brooks, which was an actual ship that um, sailed out of Liverpool uh, was known to carry almost twice as many people, right? So, so imagine twice as many people somehow cramped into these spaces. Okay. So, okay. Um, as a way to kind of give you a sense of how it would feel to be a person below the holds of the deck, um, Belinda Sutton, she wrote a petition to Massachusetts um, asking her former slaveholder to support her in her old age. Um, and in that petition, she talks about the ways in which um, 300 Africans in chains suffering the most excruciating torment, and some of them rejoicing that the pangs of death came like a balm. Um, so again, when we think about the impossibility of representing this experience, right, um, she's talking about the ways in which people uh, would, would um, welcome death um, as an escape from from slavery. Alexander Falconridge, who was a uh, white British servant, surgeon, or doctor, <laughs> aboard um, a slave ship 
he later became an abolitionist, he writes about the confined air rendered noxious by the effluvia exhaled from their bodies and being repeatedly breathed soon produces fevers and fluxes, which generally carries off great numbers. Um, Alato Equiano, um, an enslaved man um, who became free um, and was, was also um, an astute sailor and an early abolitionist. Uh, he wrote, such were the horrors of my views and fears that if 10,000 worlds had been my own, I would have freely parted with them all to have exchanged my condition with that of the meanest slave in my country. Um, uh, very quickly, I, I want to talk about uh, one particular case, uh, the Zong Massacre in 1781. Uh, has anyone ever heard of this, of this case? Uh, so the Zong Massacre encouraged uh, Britain to regulate the slave trade. Um, what happened was that a, a slave ship required lots of sailors who knew what they were doing. Um, because of the danger of revolt, um, because of the, the need to move uh, enslaved Africans from one place to another quickly in order to maximize profit and reduce loss of life, um, you had to have well-seasoned sailors and you had to have enough of them. The Zong had neither. Um, they had all new uh, sailors um, who, who were not um, outfitted with enough people. And what you get is that they didn't have enough water um, to get to where they were going. They decided that what they would do is throw perfectly healthy people overboard as a way to be able to claim uh, them on an insurance uh, claim. Uh, this was brought to court. Um, and the court trial um, put slavery in the public sphere in ways that it had not been before this moment, right? So with this case, uh, what you get um, a couple of years later is regulation. Um, one of the parliamentarians named Dobin, he goes into a slave ship himself, um, and the experience so affects him that he pushes this through parliament, right? But again, we're not talking about the end of the slave trade. We're talking about regulation. Um, so, um, you know, there are fewer people who are allowed to be put on board these, these uh, uh, ships uh, as a way to kind of make it more humane. Now, um, so getting back, right, to this idea of, of somebody else's experiences... Folks like Thomas Clarkson, um, between about 1781 and 1789, um, are becoming more and more pressed to represent slavery um, in ways that seem realistic and, and more and more uh, uh, flustered about how to do so. Um, let's see, I want to read very quickly this quote from uh, James, James Field Stanfield. Um, so James Field Stanfield writes, quote, but no pen, no abilities can give more than a very faint resemblance of the horrid situation. One real view, one minute absolutely spent in the slave rooms on the Middle Passage would do more for the cause of humanity than the pen of a Robertson or the whole collective eloquence of the British Senate. So this is an abolitionist in the 18th century who's saying, gosh, what we really need is one real view, one minute absolutely spent. Um, and remember, we said this is dangerous, uh, but this is what they want. Um, <laughs> what they want um, is a virtually realistic experience of slavery for 18th century viewers to understand how awful it is to be aboard a slave ship. Um, okay. I'm going to move forward a little bit because I'm running out of uh, time. I, well, how am I on time? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so this gets me to my point. <laughs> um, so what 18th century thinkers did um, is that they used icons to create immersive narratives. Um, these immersive narratives were meant to simulate a sense of presence in another place and time, um, give readers the sense that they were um, actually interacting with and Thank you. Uh, shaping the, these narratives of slavery, right? This sense that they actually have one real minute absolutely spent on the slave ship. Um, okay. So what happens uh, with the slave ship Brooks blueprint um, is that it starts to get more and more detail, right? So it ended up being this kind of a two image, two dimensional representation with a little bit of written description. Um, <laughs> 
to becoming like a seven piece uh, uh, representation that tried to give an objective and scientific breakdown of every aspect of the ship. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot more written material um, that has all kinds of numbers uh, that are meant to give you a sense of the dimensions of the ship, what it was like to be there, right? Moving ever closer to this one real view, um, or so they hoped. Um, it became so, so critical um, to the, the, the movement, right? To represent slavery as though you were there, that folks played around with other media. Um, so this is a model ship. Um, that Thomas Clarkson had made for William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce was a parliamentarian who Clarkson uh, convinced to uh, stand up for the uh, abolition uh, movement in Parliament in the 1780s. Right, uh, this ship is really cool. It's, it's very small. I got to see it this summer. Um, so what, what you have here is um, all of these small figures are black paint on paper that has been pasted up aboard the uh, model ship. Um, and what Wilberforce did when he went into Parliament is he had each parliamentarian hold the ship, right, while he gave a speech, um, ex ex you know, um, absolutely uh, rejecting all these pro-slavery arguments um, and pushing for um, not only, um, gosh, pushing for not only uh, uh, regulation, but the abolition of the slave trade. Um, so, so here are some close-ups. Okay. Um, Clarkson um, later in 1788 went to France um, to speak to a man named Marabo. Um, Marabo was a French aristocrat um, who would later be involved with the French uh, Revolution um, and was a, a noted Jacobin. Um, and Marble was so impressed with the, with the blueprints that Clarkson brought um, that he made a model of the ship himself. Um, Marable was planning to um, use the ship in his own French parliament um, as a way to encourage France to make moves towards, um, if not abolishing, at least uh, uh, regulating the French slave trade. Uh, and what he did, Marable, um, is he went for even more realistic features. So I'm going to kind of, I don't know if you can see. These are supposed to be little cannonballs. Um, and if you were a slave ship, you would have these, these, these guns um, on board your ship um, as a way to uh, protect uh, your ship and the enslaved people you've kidnapped um, who represent a great deal of money for you and the people you're representing. Um, as a captain, you would want these, these guns to protect yourself. Um, missing is the, there would be a, a kind of like a barrier here, uh, separating the enslaved people, like kind of like a box, from the majority of the white folks, um, so that if enslaved people were able to escape, right, and they're uh, attempting to come at their captors, um, the barrier would allow them access to take their guns, right, and uh, better control the revolt. Do, can you visualize that? But that's missing, right? Also missing um, is, is a sense of, of se smell, um, a sense of sound, right? So even though we're, we're moving towards a desire towards um, greater representation of reality, uh, I think I have some pictures where you can see the little, the little bodies. Um, what Maribu did was he had the little bodies made of iron uh, and instead of ink on paper, right? Um, so you have the, these tangible, hundreds of, of touchable figures that remind you of the human form, right? So getting closer to reality, but um, lacking all of the, all the aspects, all the sensations that you would have felt if you were actually under the hold of that ship, right? Um, the, the cries of, of other people around you, right, um, those, are, those are absent. Um, so what you get, oh, before, before I go, Maribu's is a really fascinating uh, situation. So Maribu was really impressed by, by the ship, um, but unable to use it in Parliament. He kept it in his dining room. Um, 
And so I was thinking through what does it mean, right? Uh, to have this uh, slave ship in your dining room, uh, the slave ship being a, a floating prison. Um, he called it a, in French a floating coffin and also a site of revolution. What does it mean to have that, a model of that, right, in miniature in your dining room? Um, and the way I'm thinking about it, if, if he really did understand uh, what it was like, what one minute would be aboard that ship, right, it would make it impossible to eat or to talk with your friends. Um, but, but what it did was it gave a dangerous sense of familiarity with the problem, right, a, a sense that you, you understood it. Um, and this is, this is where I get to this, uh, this idea of danger, right? Um, do you remember the, the image I showed you earlier of uh, Charles Ball, how his image had been replaced by the anti-slavery icon? Um, Ball, uh, in his preface to Ball's story, so Ball could not write. He was not literate. Um, other enslaved people like Frederick Douglass Harriet Jacobs, they wrote their own narratives, and that was a part of the title because it was um, illegal for enslaved people to learn how to read and write, right? So it was um, a part of uh, the title, if you could, but Ball could not, and someone else wrote it for him. Um, and Isaac Fisher, a white lawyer, um, he says this as a way to praise the book, right? Many of Ball's opinions have been cautiously omitted or carefully suppressed as being of no value to the reader and his sentiments upon the subject of slavery have not been embodied in this work. My design has been to render the narrative as simple and the style of the story as plain as the laws of language would permit, so as to introduce the reader to a view of the cotton fields and exhibit to his very eyes the mode of life to which the slaves must conform. So what Fisher wants, right, is to give the viewer the sense that they are there on the plantation, um, that they are witnessing with their own eyes what Ball experienced. Um, and I would argue <laughs> that the danger of that is that the enslaved person um, is um, displaced, right? Um, they are not only displaced, right? There's a, a um, dangerous familiarity with the story that they have to tell. Um, so before I end, I want to kind of talk about my, the title of my talk. Um, <laughs> the title is modeled after uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's uh, very famous novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, or The Huts of Slavery. Um, one of the, the, uh, the uh, subtitles that she worked with before she decided on the one that was published was Uncle Tom's Cabin, or How a Man Becomes a Thing. Um, what, what Stowe wanted to do in the novel, she was a, an abolitionist, but she was also a, a devoted Christian. Um, and what she wanted was to help her readers see um, enslaved people as being made in the image of God. Um, and she did this by having two figures that were Christ-like figures, um, Uncle Tom and Ava. Right, so, so this is Uncle Tom, that's Ava. Um, and Uncle Tom was an enslaved man who, are you guys familiar with this novel, with the story? Um, Uncle Tom was an enslaved man whose master decides to sell him off um, because the master owes a debt that he cannot pay. Um, Uncle Tom is a devoted family man. He has a wife and children. Um, he's also uh, very much respected by his master as being a good worker and a loyal worker and a strong Christian. Um, but he's sold nonetheless, and he has the opportunity to run away um, but he chooses not to do so because he feels it would be dishonorable. Um, and Uncle Tom, this is him saving a little girl. He's on the ship where uh, he's being moved to. He doesn't know where, right? But he's been sold away from his family. He's on his ship going to his new master. Um, a little girl, Ava, falls into the water and um, he rescues her. Right. So this, this imagery, I think, speaks to Stowe's vision for her novel. All right, the way in which she's understanding uh, Uncle Tom as um, a figure who is heroic um, in his devotion to God. And this sense of Uncle Tom as hero, right, as a um, devoted Christian, gets lost almost immediately in pop culture in the 1850s. Um, Uncle Tom ends up on the minstrel stage, um, and he becomes a, a kind of caricature of the original um, icon, right? So the book, 
um, makes Uncle Tom into an iconic figure, but that iconic figure very be soon becomes a caricature. Um, going back to Fleetwood's idea about the ways in which uh, uh, the black icon is always honored and venerated. So to end, I want to talk about the ways in which um, uh, the, the iconography of Uncle Tom um, represents actual photographs of actual people. Um, this man is named Gordon. Um, Gordon was an enslaved man who ran away um, from slavery in 1863. Um, after the Emancipation Proclamation, he used uh, that invitation by Lincoln um, as a way to take his own freedom, right, um, and go and join the Union Army in the fight to end slavery. Um, Gordon is, is famous not because of this image of him, um, but because of an image of him with his back scourged with whips uh, from a beating that almost killed him uh, a few Christmases before this time. I, I, I won't show that image, you probably know it, right? Because um, I'm trying to undo the icon, right? So, so, so this image of, of Gordon, right? There's one, as far as I know, that exists. Um, it was only discovered maybe five years ago. Um, and what we get instead is um, the image of the man with the scourged back. We often don't know his name. Um, and during the 1850s, he was described as Uncle Tom, right, instead of Gordon, right. So we, what we get is the repetition of these icons um, that replace actual individuals, um, and those individuals are lost to history, their names, and their images, and their stories. Um, All right, so I think I want to kind of end by uh, thinking about how, how the icon, um, as a way to think about um, abolition, actually repeats the systems of dishonor that made slavery possible. Um, and I want to kind of just invite you to think with me, right? Um, what, what are some ways to tell these impossible stories? Um, and, uh, and I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you. I'll end there.